So the next talk is called KTRW, the journey to build a debuggable iPhone. Well, hardware debugging of an iPhone is usually not possible. Um, it's not possible with iOS devices, or it wasn't possible with iOS devices. And security research of the kernel is therefore quite a challenge. Well, with the Apple A10 chip, Apple implemented a thing called kernel text read-only regions, which is called um, KTRR in short. And um, Brendan Asad of Google Project Zero, he found a way to um, make a debuggable iPhone. And tonight he's um, going to tell us um, how he broke this KTRR and how he made a debuggable iPhone out of a regular production iPhone. Please give a warm round of applause to Brendan. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very excited to be here. Uh, thank you for showing up to my talk. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to take you along my journey to uh, build a capability that I've wanted to have for a very long time, a debuggable iPhone. So what exactly do I mean by a debuggable iPhone? Uh, well, in order to kind of give you the context that you need to understand this, I'm going to need to talk about something which isn't frequently talked about in public. And it's a thing called uh, dev-fused devices, development-fused devices, prototype iPhones. Uh, these are all names for similar concept, which is a uh, type of device, a type of iPhone that has uh, extra debug capabilities built into it. So that's things like serial wire debug, uh, JTAG, um, basically functionality that now allows you to debug the phone at a very low level. For example, doing things like single stepping through the bootloader, uh, putting breakpoints in kernel mode and dumping registers, modifying registers, uh, sorts of things which would be very important for Apple engineers to be able to do, but which are definitely not something Apple wants available on production iPhones distributed uh, en masse. Now, in order to uh, connect to these special type of iPhones debug capabilities, you need a uh, really uh, special type of cable, uh, usually called a probe. Um, it, uh, here's an example of what's called a Konzi cable. Um, it has a special lightning connector on one end, uh, which has a special accessory ID burned into it, which allows it to communicate with the uh, uh, debug hardware on the phone. Uh, it has a controller, which is the chunky part in the middle, which is able to talk the debugging protocol. And it has a USB port on the other end, which you can connect to a laptop. And on the laptop, you would typically run uh, software. Uh, for example, there's this tool which you can find uh, online called Asterisk. This is not uh, software which Apple is willingly distributing. This is kind of, uh, as I understand it, leaked uh, code. So it's not something which uh, is like you know sanctioned. Um, but there are people who are able to uh, obtain this software uh, and use it to operate uh, these debug probes. Uh, here's an example of a screenshot where someone was able to uh, use a Kong serial wire debug probe uh, and connect it to a 32-bit uh, dev-fused iPhone. And uh, you can see register dumps. Uh, you can read and write memory, do all sorts of really low-level debugging uh, on this iPhone. Now, I need to say I do not use dev-fused devices. I don't have access to these devices. I don't want to have access to these devices to do my work. That being said, it would really be incredibly useful to have such a low level and powerful debug capability. So this is the motivation for my research project. I wanted to find some way to build a debug capability on a regular uh, Apple certified iPhone some way to build my own homebrewed dev phone. And there were a number of different features that I wanted uh, present in this homebrewed dev phone. I wanted the ability to patch kernel memory, and in particular, the ability to uh, patch the executable code in the kernel, for example, uh, modifying existing instructions or injecting kernel shell code, things like that. Um, I wanted the ability to uh, kind of do your standard debugger features, set breakpoints, set watch points. Um, 
kind of the, the third item that I wanted this debug phone to be capable of is I wanted it to use only you know, standard off-the-shelf debuggers. I didn't want to use uh, or to depend upon uh, proprietary uh, Apple software like Asterisk in order to operate. Uh, the next item is I wanted this uh, homebrewed dev phone to be updatable. So I wanted to find some sort of low-level vulnerability such that if I'm going to spend, you know, three months trying to create this uh, debuggable phone and then Apple is able to patch uh, the whatever technique was being used in the next version of iOS and now all of a sudden I no longer am able to debug the latest version, um, certainly this would be very useful. I can always uh, diff kind of the differences between subsequent versions of iOS to still get useful information from my uh, debugger, but I would really love to be able to amortize the development cost of this debugger over many iterations of the iOS operating system, so keep this capability alive as long as possible. Um, in practice, what this meant was I was going to be looking for perhaps a bootloader vulnerability, um, maybe some sort of hardware bug, something which was uh, either difficult to patch, or even if it was patched, it was early enough in the boot process that it would still be possible to update the version of I the iOS kernel uh, running on the device. And the uh, final thing is that I wanted this uh, dev phone to use only parts that you could obtain at an Apple store. So no specially fused CPUs, no uh, special debug cables, uh, nothing of that sort. Uh, now, I want to mention something really, really important that happened, uh, probably the most important thing to happen to iOS security research uh, in several years. Uh, and that is uh, pretty much just a couple of days before I was about to open source uh, KTRW, uh, Axiom X released a boot ROM exploit for uh, all iPhones between the iPhone 4S and the iPhone 10. Now, the boot ROM exploit is actually strictly more powerful than the capability used in KTRW. Everything that I want to do in my debug phone is totally possible to do using the boot ROM exploit alone. Um, so I want to tell you this just so that you're aware that many of the assumptions that I made going into this project really don't hold anymore, but they did hold at the time that I started this research. And I do expect that future debug capabilities and future research platforms on the iPhone will be based around the boot ROM exploit instead. Uh, so with that, let's talk about uh, the main mitigation that makes uh, kernel debugging on iPhone right now both really hard to do and also so important. And that's a mitigation called KTRR. If we look back at the list of requirements that I wanted in my uh, homebrew dev phone, uh, the very first item on this list was I wanted the ability to patch kernel memory, and in particular to patch the executable code. Uh, now, normally, on most systems, this isn't actually that difficult. Uh, once you have the ability to read and write kernel memory, you can just modify page tables, make some page in memory, read, write, execute, stuff your shell code in there, and you're basically done. Uh, but on the iPhone, Apple has added a mitigation called KTRW. And the idea is that we have uh, a kernel cache in memory that's been you know, put there by some sort of secure boot process. Um, but once it's in memory and the system is running, uh, Apple would really like a way to guarantee that the kernel cache gets locked down as much as possible, and any data in it which really does not need to be writable is never going to be modified. Basically, keep uh, the guarantee that once an iPhone is booted, the code running in your kernel is exactly the code that was protected by and verified by the secure boot process. So there is some data in your kernel which does need to be writable. Um, but there's also a bunch of data which really does not need to be writable. Uh, the most prominent example is the executable code. Clearly, we don't want that to be uh, changeable. Uh, but there's also a bunch of other pieces of data which are worth protecting. Uh, for example, you have strings, maybe format strings, uh, virtual method tables, the page tables that are mapping the kernel cache itself into memory. Um, all of these additional pieces of data, um, Apple would really like to have them be protected and not modifiable. And that's what KTRR does. It's going to lock down uh, all of this data that uh, we want to be read-only as the defenders. Uh, so as far as we know, KTRR stands for Kernel Text Read-Only Region. 
Um, so what it, KTRR boils down to is it's a very strong form of write, XOR, execute protection. Uh, it's available in Apple A10 CPUs and later, and it provides two very strong guarantees. First is that all writes to memory inside of the region protected by KTRR will fail. Uh, but this basically is what provides kind of the lockdown guarantee that what was put there by uh, the secure boot chain kind of stays that way and can't be changed. Uh, but there's another part to it which is equally important, and that is that all instruction fetches from memory outside of the protected region uh, are guaranteed to fail. This is what ensures that you can't put new executable code in the kernel, that the only code that you're allowed to run is uh, the kernel's own code. So in order to kind of understand how this works in a little more detail, uh, let's look at an oversimplified diagram of how uh, CPU works. Uh, so here we have the uh, CPU cores. This is, for example, an A11 CPU with six cores. Uh, the little uh, purple box in the bottom corner is the MMU. Uh, we have the highest level of the cache hierarchy is the L2 cache. Uh, behind that is the memory controller called AMCC. And uh, then this is connected to DRAM. Uh, now the kernel lives contiguously uh, in physical memory in DRAM. And this is what Apple wants to protect with KTRR. So uh, the first step in order to lock down this region happens on the MMU. So let's zoom in to a single CPU core. Uh, what Apple has done, as far as uh, I understand, is basically just add couple of registers to the MMU that point to the beginning and ending address of the region to protect. Uh, what this allows us to do is the CPU core can now check whether each instruction it's about to execute violates the security guarantees we want from KTRR. So for example, let's say uh, the CPU wants to issue a write to a physical address outside of the KTRR region. That's fine. We can, we can write to that memory. So this will be allowed by the MMU, and uh, the write will go through. If, however, we try to issue a write to an address that points to inside the KTRR region, uh, this violates the security properties of KTRR. And so the MMU will recognize this, it'll deny the write, and it'll cause uh, that instruction to fault. Similarly, if the CPU tries to execute uh, an instruction that is fetched from an address outside of the KTRR region, um, the MMU can recognize this and cause that instruction fetch default. Um, but so here's kind of the new picture of the CPU cores. We have a bunch of new registers in the MMU that kind of have this uh, KTRR protection uh, built into them. Uh, the next, however, this isn't the complete picture that we need in order to uh, protect this memory. See, there are other uh, devices that are connected to your system, uh, all sorts of peripherals. This could be like a Wi-Fi chip, this could be like a USB stack, um, all sorts of things, any sort of hardware device which could uh, issue DMA commands to your memory controller. So in order to protect against malicious peripherals, uh, DMAing over the protected region, uh, we think that Apple has added registers to the memory controller as well that also point to the beginning and ending address of uh, this lockdown region, uh, such that that way, any time some peripheral tries to DMA over the secure region, the memory controller sees that this DMA doesn't look valid, and it'll just discard the write. Uh, so this is kind of the uh, picture that the hardware now looks like uh, in order to support KTRR. Um, but this isn't actually the complete story either because uh, there's one specific edge case that needs to be properly handled. And that's when a CPU core goes to sleep for a little bit and then wakes up, what's called resetting. Uh, anytime uh, the, a CPU core goes to sleep, uh, it's going to power down registers, and in particular, the MMU uh, registers which store the KTRR bounds uh, are going to lose their value and be reset to zero. So when the CPU wakes up from sleep, we need some way to reset those registers to point to the beginning and ending bounds of the lockdown region. So uh, the reset vector is the first piece of code that gets executed when a CPU core wakes from sleep. And it does so with the MMU off. Uh, and what Apple has done is they've added code to the reset vector that basically just initializes those KTRR registers. Uh, the beginning and ending bounds are stored in these global variables. Uh, these variables, by the way, happen to lie inside of the locked down region, so they can't be modified. Uh, and once it reads those values into general purpose registers, it writes those bounds 
into special system registers uh, that are used by the MMU to uh, verify the KTRR security properties. So uh, once this code executes, KTRR will be locked down on the MMU, and once again, you can no longer uh, execute memory that lies outside of the lockdown region. So now that we have kind of a high-level understanding of how KTRR works, uh, let's look at how it's possible to break KTRR. And we'll start with a few historical examples. There are uh, two historical instances of partial KTRR bypasses up till now. Um, and the first one came out uh, pretty soon after uh, the KTRR mitigation was first introduced. And it was discovered by uh, Luca Tedesco, who's going to be giving a talk, uh, I think, in this room uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, so what Luca found was that uh, Apple had left an instruction in the kernel cache uh, that they didn't mean to leave executable, but it accidentally was. This was the MSR TTBR1 instruction, which sets the special TTBR1 uh, register. Uh, this register stores the physical address of the root of the page table hierarchy, uh, which means that if you're able to modify the value of this register, then you are able to supply your own custom page table hierarchy and therefore remap virtual memory onto new physical pages. Um, so this is exactly what he did. Uh, he just uh, chose a uh, remapping that placed the read-only regions of the kernel memory onto new physical pages that contained a copy of uh, the original kernel data. Now, it's important to note that uh, KTR was still actually fully initialized uh, at the point at which uh, you were able to execute this MSR instruction. Um, so we can patch read-only data but we can't execute new kernel code because KTRR lockdown on the MMU still did occur. Um, so what the KTRR bypass in 10.1 uh, basically achieved was limiting what was protected by KTRR down from the whole read-only region to only the executable code. But we get a whole bunch of new uh, data in the kernel, which is now writable. The second uh, KTRR bypass uh, that was released was uh, more of a bypass in spirit than in practice, but it's definitely a very important tool and a huge inspiration for uh, my research. Uh, so back in iOS 11.1.2, uh, Ian Beer found that uh, the debugging functionality uh, in the ARM specification was actually implemented in Apple's processors and could be used to implement a full-featured kernel debugger. So if you read the ARM architecture reference manual, you'll find that there are uh, documentation on a feature called self-hosted debugging. Basically, the architecture provides a set of debug registers, which you can access via um, MSR instructions. And you can use these debugging registers to set uh, breakpoints in kernel mode and also to uh, by uh, implementing ex exception handling code uh, in your exception handler, you can catch your own uh, breakpoint exceptions and basically have the kernel implement its own debugger. Uh, for example, this might be somewhat analogous to using uh, a KDP to debug a MacBook. Now, KDP has actually been removed from the iOS kernel that's distributed on production devices. However, the debugging registers that one might use to implement this are still present, still fully functional. And what Ian found was that he could use return-oriented programming to set the values of these registers correctly in order to implement a uh, rather full-featured kernel debugger. Um, he built something that works with LLDB, um, proved quite useful. Um, and in particular, it was able to, by setting you know, breakpoints, single-stepping, modify register values, execute existing instructions in the kernel in basically arbitrary order. So not native, like, arbitrary shellcode execution, but pretty darn close. So I started this project of trying to find some sort of KTRR bypass by looking in kind of the places that I thought would be more powerful, find more powerful KTRR bypasses, more likely to lead to something that would be persistent across multiple versions of iOS. Uh, where I started was looking in iBoot. I was trying to find some sort of iBoot bug in the image for parsing and verification functions. Uh, I didn't end up finding anything there. 
Um, next, I kind of read through several sections of the ARM architecture manual, uh, saw some interesting things about, you know, maybe, you know, if you have weird malformed TLB uh, uh, entry, or if you have weird malformed page table entries, you could do something weird with the TLB. Um, that didn't really end up yielding anything useful. Um, I played around a little bit with, you know, uh, I kind of misunderstood how KTRR worked a little bit, and I thought, you know, maybe there's a way to uh, corrupt the L2 cache and then bypass KTRR that way. Um, that didn't end up really working either. Uh, so I kind of, you know, tried a bunch of things. None of them really panned out, and I put uh, this research on the back burner for a while. And it was actually while I was doing something totally unrelated that I happened to generate a kernel panic, which reignited my interest. So I was playing around with interrupts, and I'd managed to get a CPU core stuck in an infinite loop with interrupts disabled in kernel mode. Uh, and I got a panic message which said, you know, panic, watchdog, timer, timeout, CPU one has failed to respond. So kind of the exact thing you would expect when a CPU isn't responding because it's stuck uh, burning CPU cycles in an infinite loop. Uh, eventually the system notices and panics because, you know, there's some significant problem here. But what really caught my attention about this panic message was uh, something much earlier in it, where it says, attempting to forcibly halt CPU one. Now this was really interesting to me because according to what I'd read from the ARM uh, manual, there wasn't any standard way for one CPU core to halt a second CPU. Like there's no MSRs that you can write to. I didn't really remember any way to accomplish this. So what I figured was there's probably some sort of like proprietary interface going on here where, you know, maybe there's uh, special CPU control registers which are accessible via MMIO and somehow uh, XNU is trying to leverage those in order to halt the CPU. So this seems like, you know, pretty interesting. I'd never seen something like this before. Uh, so I decided to, you know, pull up the... Uh, 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 security engineering tools needed to uh, figure out what was going on here. So I grepped through the XNU source code to try to find uh, the string attempting to forcibly halt CPU. I pretty quickly came to the function ML debug wrap halt CPU, uh, which seemed to implement this functionality. Um, it takes the index of which CPU uh, you want to halt. So on a CPU with six cores, it would be the index zero through five. Uh, and uh, the actual part which halts the CPU is just right down here a couple of lines lower. Uh, so what this does is it reads a uh, pointer to some volatile memory from a per CPU data structure. Uh, this is memory, this variable that stores the pointer to the memory is called debug wrap reg. Uh, and then the actual part of the code which halts the CPU is simply consists of the single line where it writes uh, some special debug halt value to the debug wrap reg. So this really strongly uh, supports the idea that this is some, you know, special MMIO register. And when I was looking online for trying to find references to this debug wrap thing, um, I wasn't really get getting any results. So it kind of really strongly suggested that, yes, this is some sort of proprietary Apple-specific uh, interface. Uh, the other thing that kind of caught my attention was this reference to something called CoreSight. I remembered hearing, you know, CoreSight somewhere else before, but it didn't really, didn't really know what it was, marked it as something to come back to. Uh, but what really caught my attention when I was looking through this file was a function just a few lines down uh, called ML debug wrap halt CPU with state. This does basically the same thing as the other function, except in addition to halting a CPU, it also reads out the values of the registers on that CPU that was just halted. And the way that it does this is actually quite remarkable. So first off, you can see that there's another reference to uh, this core site thing. It says, ensure memory mapped core site registers can be written. Um, so clearly something with core site is important here. Maybe it's the block of registers that contain this uh, functionality. Um, but the important part is this uh, for loop right below, which iterates I over the indices of your general purpose registers. Uh, what this code does is first it's going to generate the uh, numerical opcode for the instruction uh, which writes the value of general purpose register XI into the special system register debug DTR. So this isn't an instruction which already exists in the kernel cache. It is just literally generating the numerical value of the opcode for that instruction. Uh, next, it passes that uh, opcode into ML debug wrap stuff instruction. 
Uh, and finally, it reads the value of the debug DTR register and writes the value into the output buffer's XI field. So this is actually really interesting because what it suggests is that ML debug wrap stuff instruction is somehow executing dynamically generated instructions. And this really flies in the face of the security model uh, that KTRR is designed for. So KTRR is meant to ensure that, you know, all of the instructions in your kernel cache, those are the only ones that you're allowed to execute. But here, there's some sort of interface which seems to be able to execute any instruction you want on a halted CPU. So this is definitely really interesting. Now, just because there's code to do something in XNU doesn't actually mean that it necessarily works in practice. So uh, I basically just decided to uh, test to see if this code actually runs. Uh, I pulled up an old kernel exploit that I'd written, and I uh, basically just wrote and packed together something that would call the function ML debug wrap halt CPU with state, uh, pass it an output buffer, and then dump the contents of that buffer. Uh, and what I found was that the output buffer really did look like a bunch of registers. So there's a bunch of stuff which was zero, which, you know, is kind of weird, but the value of CPSR does look correct. It actually looks like a CPU running in kernel mode. Uh, and the value of PC, it doesn't really look like a normal kernel virtual address. Those usually start with, you know, like FFFF. But um, it does really look like some sort of physical address, perhaps. Uh, and with a little bit of uh, digging into this, I uh, pretty quickly discovered that this is uh, a physical address of an instruction in the reset vector. Now things are really, really getting interesting because what this suggests is that we've managed to halt the execution of a CPU core while it's actually running the reset vector, and in particular before the MMU has been turned on. Now this is a really uh, critical point in time for KTRR because before the MMU has been turned on, KTRR is unable to protect the CPU from executing instructions outside of the locked down region. So of course what I really wanted to know was how do we use this capability in order to bypass KTRR? Well it turns out that there's kind of a more fundamental question that I needed to answer first, which was what exactly is this core site thing anyway? It's really hard in practice to, uh, at least for me, to exploit something without kind of knowing a general sense of how something works. Uh, and so I basically just searched for uh, core site in the ARM reference manual and came across a bunch of references to core site in connection with something called the external debug interface. Now, the external debug interface, it turns out, is pretty much just a different way of accessing the same functionality that Ian used in his uh, self-hosted kernel debugger. Um, so the, in the self-hosted debugging interface, you write to these debug registers using MSR instructions. Uh, the external debug interface uh, provides kind of the sim very similar functionality. It's probably the same uh, debugging hardware under the hood that you're driving, but the interface to access these registers is via MMIO rather than via executing MSR instructions. So this means that basically the functionality that is necessary to build a kernel debugger is still there, even though the ROP gadgets that Ian used to activate it are taken away, um, the memory mapped interface still exists. And in fact, this isn't even the first time, uh, not even close to the first time, that someone has uh, tried to use debugging registers in an ARM processor in order to mount some sort of privileged attack. Uh, uh, Xinyu uh, Ning and Fengwei Zhang presented an attack at MOSEC 2019, where they uh, basically were able to leverage these same debugging registers on Android phones to break the protection of the uh, 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 secure world. So uh, they were able to um, make one CPU core debug another CPU core, make that second CPU core execute instructions to enter the secure world at EL3, and then also make it execute instructions that would cause it to read and write memory in the secure world. Uh, so just to summarize kind of the key concepts behind the external debug interface, uh, it is an on-chip debugging architecture. It provides per-CPU uh, debug registers, which are accessible via MMIO. Uh, 
Um, the actual interface itself, how to use these registers, is really extensively documented in the R manual. Um, it talks about you know what the names of all the registers are, the offsets of them, uh, like how to program the registers in order to uh, do things like set breakpoints and watchpoints. So I'm not going to go over all of that uh, right here. But what I will say is that the external debug interface is certainly more than powerful enough to do any sort of kernel debugging that we might be interested in. It's definitely capable of setting breakpoints and watchpoints, single stepping execution, executing arbitrary instructions, uh, poking at memory, all this sort of stuff. So the idea for my attack was we have these debugging registers, we can do things like single stepping, and we know that we can halt execution in the reset vector. So I basically decided I would try to use the external debug interface to single step the reset vector, and then once uh, the reset vector is about to execute the KTRR lockdown instructions, just jump over that piece of code so KTRR never gets initialized. So if we look at the reset vector, we'll just step through all of the first instructions, and then once we see that we've hit this uh, conditional branch uh, where we're just about to start doing the KTRR register initialization, set x17 to 0, jump over the KTRR code altogether. Now, um, this is a nice idea, but we don't actually have all the tools yet necessary in order to carry it out. We know that we can halt a CPU, and we know that we can execute arbitrary instructions on it and do things like modify the values in registers. But we haven't yet found the ability to resume executing on the CPU after it's been halted. So if we set a breakpoint on the reset vector, for example, that's nice, but it's not going to be of much use if we can't continue execution after that point. Uh, furthermore, there's another somewhat more subtle issue, which is that uh, we're using one CPU to hijack another CPU as it resets. But CPU resets happen all the time. Any time a CPU core is idle for a couple of seconds, it'll uh, eventually just do a reset as it powers down and powers back up again. Um, so we're going to have to do this KTRR uh, hijack. We're going to need to uh, modify the execution of the reset vector and skip the KTR initialization every single time that a CPU core resets unless we can find some way to disable the core from resetting. So I didn't know how to do either of these two things, um, so I kind of just decided to play around with that original proprietary register that I'd found earlier. So the XNU source code documents a couple of the bits. I think it documents two of the bits in that register. Um, the remaining bits are undocumented. So I figured, you know, might as well set some bits, clear some bits, see what happens, see if I learn anything interesting. And I kid you not, by sheer dumb luck, it happened that that register contained exactly the pieces of functionality we needed to pull uh, this hijack together. So bit 30, uh, actually will clear the uh, halt and it'll allow the CPU to resume executing. And bit 26 will keep the CPU powered up so that it doesn't subsequently reset and then we have to re-hijack the reset vector. Uh, so basically the attack that we described before uh, works perfectly well uh, once we have this new functionality. We just uh, make sure that once we hit this branch, we skip over the KTRR register lockdown code, and then these registers never get written to, KTRR is never initialized on the system, and kernel memory becomes executable. So what this looks like is first we have KTRR enabled. Once we do this hijack, KTRR is disabled on the MMU, and now any uh, page and kernel memory could now potentially be executed. <laughs> Got a little bit more to go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now that we've uh, found a way to break KTRR, uh, I want to talk about how to build an actual debugger on top of this, because this I found it to be a quite non-trivial challenge. Uh, so there were a number of steps involved in this process, and actually in many of them, I encountered issues that I thought would be basically insurmountable. Uh, so the first step in the process is we need uh, to remap the kernel, uh, because even though we've enabled the ability to execute arbitrary kernel shellcode, we don't yet have the ability to patch kernel memory. Uh, next, we need to uh, figure out some way to load a kernel extension. 
Uh, we need to make sure that we're properly handling interrupts because we're going to be disabling, or sorry, we're going to be halting CPUs. And once a CPU is halted, it of course can't service interrupts anymore. Uh, we're going to need to establish some sort of communication channel between the uh, kernel extension running in your iPhone and your laptop running LLDB. And finally, we need to implement a GDB stub to process the packets sent by LLDB and drive the debugging hardware. So at the point at which we bypassed KTRR, uh, we have the ability to execute arbitrary kernel shellcode, but we don't yet have the ability to patch kernel memory. The reason for this is that even though we've disabled KTRR on the MMUs, it's still fully enabled on the memory controller. So even though we can uh, execute code outside of the read-only region, the read-only region's uh, physical pages are still fully protected, and we can't modify them persistently. Uh, so this is actually kind of problematic for us. Uh, we really do need to modify uh, the page table permissions in order to make the kernel extension's memory executable. And the root of the page table hierarchy uh, lies inside of the KTRR region, which is still protected. So the solution to this is to basically do exactly the same thing that uh, Luca did in uh, the 10.1.1 bypass, which is to remap the kernel onto fresh writable pages and set TTBR1 to point to the new page tables instead. So what that looks like is initially the TTBR1 registers is going to point to the uh, root of the page tables, which lies inside the protected region. Uh, what we have to do is we need to copy the kernel, the pages containing uh, the kernel, we need to copy the data of that onto new writable pages that are outside of the protected region, uh, update the page tables in kernel memory, and then uh, make TTBR1 point to the new modified page tables instead. And with that, we do now have the ability to patch the kernel. Uh, so the next step in this process is we need the ability to load kernel extensions. Uh, this actually turns out is uh, pretty simple once we bypassed KTRR. Uh, all we have to do is we need to allocate some memory to put the kernel extension in, uh, copy in the binary, uh, dynamically link the kernel extension against the kernel that's running, because uh, if you want to have a kernel extension, presumably you're going to want to call kernel functions at various points. Uh, after that, we need to modify page tables to make the kernel extension executable. And finally, we need to call some function in the kernel extension to begin it running. Uh, and with that, we're now ready to start designing a, a kernel debugger. So what I eventually settled on was a pretty simple design. I would have one core in the CPU, which I called the monitor core, is going to be exclusively reserved for the KTRW debugger itself. So it's no longer going to be running XNU. Uh, all of the other cores in the system are going to continue to run your operating system as they do normally. Uh, when you set a breakpoint or a watchpoint on one of the debugged cores, um, it's going to cause that core to halt and enter debug state. So uh, the monitor core is just going to sit in a tight loop polling all of the other cores to see when they enter debug state. And when it notices this, it'll send a message to LLDB over some communication channel saying, hey, this core halted because it hit a breakpoint, and then LLDB can uh, take care of the rest. Now, when I implemented this, I pretty quickly encountered weird panic messages. Uh, so this is one example, AOP panic, no pulse on something or other. Uh, and it took a little bit of effort, but what I eventually learned was this was being caused by uh, a processor on the device call it, called the always-on processor sending periodic interrupts to the main application processor. And the interrupts that are sent by the always-on processor need to be handled or else the AOP will panic. And once the AOP panics, it brings down the whole system. Now, some of these interrupts are actually relatively easy to disable. Um, I reverse engineered the uh, watchdog timer kernel extension and found the uh, hardware interface, the set of registers needed to uh, disable that. But there were other interrupts which I wasn't able to narrow down, I wasn't able to disable. Now, I'm 
I strongly suspect that uh, the DevFuse devices that uh, some are able to acquire do have the ability to uh, disable these interrupts or, other, or in some way are not affected uh, by this problem. Because presumably when Apple's engineers are uh, using one of these devices to debug the kernel and they halt the kernel for a few seconds, it's not a great user interface if when they resume uh, execution, the whole kernel panics because of this uh, interrupt problem. So I strongly suspect there's a way to fix this problem, but I wasn't able to find it. Uh, instead, I basically implemented a big hack, which is that I started servicing interrupts from the AOP on the monitor core itself. Now this introduced its own problem, which is that now execution on the monitor core can jump back into XNU uh, and start running the IRQ handler at basically any time. And that includes when any of the debugged cores is halted holding an IRQ critical spin lock. This is a huge problem because once we try to acquire that same spin lock, we can't acquire it, it's already held, and the only way that lock can be released is if that debugged core is resumed, which it has to be done by us. So we enter this deadlock. For a very long time, I thought that this was pretty much an unsolvable problem for my debugger, but it actually turns out there's a really, really simple solution. And the reason is that the XNU kernel itself has to deal with this problem. See, when an IRQ is delivered and some code is processing the IRQ, uh, if interrupts were enabled, then a second uh, IRQ could be delivered and cause the uh, IRQ handler to be re-entered, in which case that same lock would be grabbed a second time. What that means is that interrupts have to be disabled while in an IRQ critical region which means it's really easy to test for whether it's safe to halt one of the debugged cores. You just check whether interrupts are enabled or not. If interrupts are disabled, that means that it's possibly in an IRQ critical region, and you just wait a little bit of time before halting that core. Uh, and after that, all of my interrupt problems pretty much disappeared. So now we're at the point where we have a uh, text running in the kernel, we seem to be able to halt and resume CPU cores, but we need some way for LLDB running on your laptop to communicate with the debugger running on your iPhone's kernel. I considered a number of different options, uh, each with various advantages and disadvantages. Uh, Serial is really, really nice because it's incredibly simple to implement. Uh, USB I liked because it would be really, really fast. Um, Wi-Fi I kind of just threw in there in case the other two didn't work. There wasn't any really compelling reason to implement a debugger over Wi-Fi. Um, what really made the decision was the disadvantages of each uh, technique. So for Serial, um, as far as I'm aware, you do need special hardware in order to operate, uh, communicate with the iPhone over Serial. So this basically violates the first goal, one of the goals of my uh, homebrewed dev phone, which is that you don't need any special hardware. Everything can be purchased uh, from an Apple store. Uh, the other two techniques, USB and Wi-Fi, both suffered from the same problem, which is that I would need to write a custom driver for the hardware. The reason for this is that I cannot rely in my debugger on the code that I'm debugging. If I set a breakpoint and a CPU core halts while it has some lock used by the Wi-Fi or the USB drivers, then when my application, or when my kernel debugger tries to communicate over that mechanism using the uh, stack built into XNU, it's going to try to take the same lock and deadlock, same problem we had before. So whatever communication channel we use, we need to implement a custom driver for it, which is self-contained. So out of USB and Wi-Fi, I basically figured that writing a USB stack was slightly less painful. Uh, it was pretty easy to figure out with some Googling which uh, hardware uh, USB controller was in, used in the iPhone. Uh, it's a controller by Synopsys called the DesignWare High Speed USB 2.0 on the go controller. Uh, what's somewhat unfortunate about this uh, controller is that it is proprietary. The interface that it uses to communicate is not one of the standard USB interfaces, which means that you cannot use kind of your stock uh, open source off the shelf uh, drivers for it. Uh, and when I tried to look at the data sheet to see how I could you know, program my own driver, I quickly ran into a login wall. I couldn't actually access it and I uh, was unable to obtain the data sheet for it. 
Uh, so this seemed really problematic, but one thing that I could find was uh, open source header files for this hardware. Now, there are open source drivers for operating it, but all the ones that I was able to find uh, that operated this hardware did so in uh, host mode, so kind of as a laptop rather than as a device you plug into it. Uh, and that didn't really work for me, so um, that wouldn't uh, be, uh, that wasn't what I wanted, but I was able to use the header files which contained the register definitions. Now the only place that I could think of that contained a fully self-contained implementation of, the, uh, of a USB stack that operated the exact same uh, hardware as used in the iPhone was the iPhone's very own secure ROM. So the secure ROM is the very first piece of code that runs on the application processor when it starts up. And it needs a USB stack in order to communicate uh, with a, a computer over for DFU uh, firmware upgrades. So I basically took uh, Apple's secure ROM, there are uh, dumps of it that you can find online, uh, and I put it into IDA and uh, reverse engineered the uh, secure ROM's USB stack uh, basically back to source and then re-implemented it in C. Uh, and so this was a rather painful process, but the end result was that uh, I was able to make my iPhone appear to my laptop as a special KTRW USB device. Uh, and with that, the only step left in actually implementing a debugger is implementing the GDB stub. This is pretty easy as compared to kind of the other stuff in this project. Um, the GDB specification is open source. It's basically just a bunch of parsing and then driving the external debug interface. And once that was done, I had the ability to debug a production iPhone uh, over USB, no special cables, no leaked software involved. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. So here I'll do a hopefully very quick demo of how to operate uh, this debugger. So I have an iPhone, which uh, you can see here. Uh, right now you're able to see the uh, kind of the screenshot of it on the laptop, but as soon as I operate the debugger, the USB stack will be taken over and you'll no longer be able to see this part of it. So um, what I'll do is I'll simply start the uh, app that loads the kernel extension. Uh, and so once that's running, we'll lose uh, connectivity with the device, but we can connect to it with uh, LLDB. And yeah, okay, so LLGB has recognized uh, this device as an iOS device, an iOS kernel cache. It's discovered the load address and it's halted the kernel. So we can now resume execution. Uh, now I can't show this on the display, but um, for those of you in person, you can see that the device is still responsive. You can do things like load apps, uh, and yet there's still a kernel debugger attached to the device. So we can do things, for example, I'll set a breakpoint on the syst call min core. All right, so we have a breakpoint set. Uh, now I have an application on the device that is simply going to call min core with uh, very distinctive arguments. It is possible to load an app uh, onto the device over Wi-Fi even once the USB uh, hardware has been co-opted. Um, but for uh, this demo, I'm just going to have the app pre-installed on the device. I'm going to click on the application icon, and it basically immediately halts. Uh, CP the uh, phone is no longer responsive because we're halted at a breakpoint. We can do things like get a backtrace. We can examine registers, so we'll look at the memory pointed to by register X1, and we can indeed see our arguments that were passed from user space. We can do things like set watch points, kind of all of your standard uh, debugging functionality. Okay. So we'll set a watch point on this memory address and resume execution, and we basically immediately hit the watch point. Uh, and you can see the instruction that uh, triggered this watch point loads X10 and X11. And these are indeed the values that we expect. So watch points seem to function correctly. Uh, we can disable the breakpoint and the watch point. 
and resume execution. Uh, the app runs again, your phone is responsive. Uh, so basically, full featured kernel debugger. Cool. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, the debugger source code uh, is available on the Google Project Zero GitHub. Uh, I also wrote a blog post kind of describing in more detail uh, the process of finding the KTRR bypass. Um, this was a really, really fun project. And uh, I'm really uh, excited to hopefully make kernel debugging on the iPhone just a little bit easier. Future versions will probably be based on the boot ROM exploit, which I'm really excited to see what comes out of that. So thank you. Thank you very much. So we have uh, five minutes left for a Q&A. Please queue up on the microphones in between. Microphone one, two, three, four. We have some more. So, And maybe you have questions from the Signal Angel. Signal Angel? No questions from the Signal Angel. So microphone one, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for the amazing talk. Uh, at the beginning, you showed us a tweet of the exploit. Um, and you said that everything you could do is possible with this one as well. And it's sad that it's not patchable. So do you see any problems regarding security or anything uh, using such a technique? And uh, is it possible to run it like without, um, I don't know, having the iPhone unlocked? And is there any way to sort of abuse this? Which could go uh, wrong? Do you mean the uh, boot ROM bug? Or do you mean the debugging registers used here? Or both or either? Yeah, just everything. Yeah. All of the above. <laughs> Um, I don't really know. Um, this isn't really kind of my area of expertise. I can see, you know, some people might be able to leverage these types of vulnerabilities for, you know, proximal physical attacks. Um, the debugging registers that I'm using here aren't really all that useful um, for a remote attack uh, because you encounter that problem where, you know, a CPU resets and the KTRR bypass gets lost. And really, once you have a kernel code execution, you should really consider your device fully compromised anyway. So I don't really think that uh, the deb debug registers are a security issue. Um, the boot ROM, you know, maybe for physical stuff, but uh, it depends on your threat model. Thank you. Microphone four, please. Uh, did you have a look into the Linux kernel for the Design Web 2 core driver? Because it's in drivers USB DVC 2, I think. Yeah, so uh, this was actually really funny. Basically, as soon as I had finished implementing the USB stack and I'd got it working, I realized that the reason I couldn't find any uh, open source drivers online was because I was searching for the wrong things in Google. I'm just really bad at Googling. And uh, the files containing uh, the uh, driver for operating it in uh, device mode were just named something different than I expected. Um, so. You learn as you go. Great. Thanks. Microphone one, please. Hi. Uh, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I have a quick comment and then a uh, question. So um, the comment is, uh, this is the first time this is publicly revealed, but <laughs> the Vita was actually, um, the trust zone was first dumped exactly the same way through the core site register. So um, that was 2014, and I thought it was pretty funny seeing this, this still happening again and again. Um, my question is, you said you uh, reversed the, um, the USB from Secure ROM. So did you find Checkmate? <laughs> um. So uh, first about your comment, uh, definitely I uh, know that there are tons of people who have found uh, similar capabilities. Basically, nothing that I've done in this project is uh, original work. All of it is building uh, off of stuff which other people have done. So absolutely, that's definitely the case. Um, th about uh, whether I discover Checkmate or not, uh, the first time I was looking at iBoot, I basically saw the USB stack code and was like, oh my god, this is so complicated. I want to avoid touching this, if at all possible. So no, I completely missed that. Thank you. So no more questions. Please, another big round of applause for Brendan.